All right, welcome everybody. Um, I hope you all are having a good uh, Cloud Next, and uh, it looks like it's a brilliant day outside, but I know we're all excited to hear about cloud infrastructure for your data intensive workloads. So thank you for coming, and we've got some interesting uh, information we want to convey to you today. Um, we have um, some great speakers. I'm going to lead off, and then we're going to have uh, Sandeep Kohli from Senior Vice President of Engineering from Flipkart tell you about their journey from on-prem to uh, Google Cloud. And then we're going to have Jason Pohl, uh, Senior Director of Data Management for Databricks. And he's going to tell you about how Google and Databricks are working together to build a uh, collaborative solution to help you run your data intensive workloads. All right. And then uh, we'll have a Q&A. And uh, Marco and Vivek, who are both product managers uh, for Google Cloud Storage, are going to come up on stage and help with Q&A. And I don't think I mentioned it. I'm a product manager in Google Cloud Storage as well. So, all right. Uh, a common message that you're going to hear uh, at a number of our sessions is how Google is working very hard to enable you to run your AI ML workloads your cloud native workloads and your uh, inter classic enterprise storage workloads. We're uh, helping to make them performant, secure, and reliable. And so this is just look for this messaging throughout. You'll hear it uh, several times in other sessions. Let's dive into data e building data ecosystems. And um, let's start out, make sure we're all level set. So when I say data intensive workloads, what I'm talking about is just answering questions. Could be real simple questions like, how many customers do I have? It could be something more involved like, which customers are placing which orders on Wednesdays, that sort of thing. And uh, the reason we want to do it is we want to you know, make our businesses grow and, and uh, meet our business objectives. And we do this by running workloads that we all commonly refer to as AI ML, which is super popular these days, um, analytics, uh, more traditional reference, and high-performance computing. So when I say data-intensive workloads, we're talking about all these things that we uh, typically uh, identify with. So what do we need to run these workloads uh, together effectively? If you just start, say, Go, and you spin up your VMs, and you attach your storage to it, what invariably happens is you end up with a bunch of data silos. There's a lot of problems with data silos. They, are, they have a problem with availability. Um, there's a lot of copies of your data. It ends up all over the place. Things get out of sync. You have high egress costs. And it's time consuming to keep them running. So really, the solution is uh, to get all your data in one place. And with Google Cloud Storage, we give you a single source of truth to place your data. It also gives you a global endpoint and uh, geo-redundancy automatically. And it also places your data where you need it. All right. So um, we find that people are like, that's great, but we've invested heavily in, these, in, in a bunch of tools, and we want to make sure that we can still use those tools. We're 100% behind you, and we do everything we can to support you, whether you're running uh, first-party Google products such as BigQuery or open uh, source products like uh, HDFS or Spark, or partner products uh, like Databricks, and we'll be talking more, uh, you'll hear more from Databricks in a few minutes here. So we're here to support you. You choose the tool, and we'll support you in Google Cloud Storage. All right, now if you're using uh, Google services, we've built an entire ecosystem to help you run your data-intensive workloads. We put your data at the center of this ecosystem so when you want to ingest your data, you can use things like uh, storage transfer service or um, the data appliance. And then once the data is in, in the cloud, we provide services like Dataproc and BigQuery to do data processing. Now, as your data grows and you get more and more of it, it gets difficult to manage. You don't know where it is. You have security issues. We provide additional services like Dataplex to help you manage these difficult uh, data management issues. And of course, we provide world-class security and user experience and um, IAM. All right, so specifically in cloud storage, uh, how we help you run your data-intensive workloads is 
Um, we focus on making it available in the way that you need it. So let me talk a little bit our, about our location types. We have three location types, uh, regional, dual region, and multi-region. If you're just bringing your workload to, the, to our cloud and you're saying, hey, I want it to perform well and I want it to be cost effective and I'm not sure what to do, regional is a great choice for you. You're gonna get the best performance out of Google Cloud Storage if you put it in a regional uh, bucket and you will get a, a very good cost. But we know a lot of you have additional requirements aside from just running the workload. You have data protection requirements. You need the data to be in two, two regions, not just one. And you also need to be able to run workloads in multiple places. You don't want to be tied to a particular region. It could be because of uh, providence reasons uh, 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 or perhaps you have, you, you have a certain compute shapes you're looking to use. And dual region buckets you set up, you can pick two regions yourself or you can pick uh, two regions that are automatically uh, paired together already. And uh, we will uh, automatically replicate the data across those two regions. It'll give you an active, active failover capability. So if a region goes down and you're, you can still read from that endpoint and the data will be retrieved from the region that's still running. Uh, this is a perform. This is a performant uh, uh, buckets. They're they're on the same level of performance as a regional bucket, and um, it it, uh, it it allows you to run your data, uh, like I said, seamlessly in in two locations. Now, a lot of you are saying, like, two regions are great. Why not more? Well, um, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I also should mention we. Um, we added a couple features to help you uh, run uh, dual region buckets, and that is uh, replication monitoring and uh, the popularity has been growing, so we've also added the capabilities to run it in Canada and Australia. All right, so now those of you that want to uh, love this capability but you'd like to have more regions, what we offer is a multi-region bucket. So the multi-region bucket essentially covers an entire continent. You can see all the dark blue there covers most of Europe, right? We also offer multi-region in the US and Asia. And what this allows you to do is you can run your workload anywhere in the blue area, essentially across Europe as shown, and then it'll, it'll pull the data from that bucket. And multi-region buckets will store your data all in, across that region in, in two locations, so you have copies of the data and you'll be fully protected. You'll have um, active, active failover experience, same as dual region. Now, because we, you're allowing us the ability to place this data where we find it to be most cost effective, we're sharing that cost reduction with you. And so this is a more cost effective way to achieve um, data protection in, through geo redundancy. All right, now, um, this has been a really popular um, storage location type uh, and people are trying to use it for all kinds of things. And one of those things is data intensive workloads. And we thought, well, why don't we make it even better and add a cache, right? So what we're announcing today is uh, a thing we're called Anywhere Cache. The Anywhere Cache allows you to put a cache in the same zone as your compute instance. And you can see on the screen, I've got uh, two caches in zones A and B, no cache in zone C. You can put a, a cache in all three zones or one zone or any combination of zones you want. You don't pay to enable the cache, you only pay for what you use, and you scale to what you need. So the cache is a zone local cache, so it's fast, it's simple, you enable it on the bucket, and then as you read data, it automatically gets ingested into the cache, and the subsequent reads all get served from cache. It's a fully consistent cache, so if the data changes underneath, the system will, will know and, 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 do the, and, and serve a cache miss and retrieve the changed data from the bucket, repopulate the cache, you'll always get consistent data. Um, it's also great uh, when you combine Anywhere Cache with the multi-region buckets. As if you recall the, the, the um, map that I showed you of Europe, what that a multi-region bucket with Anywhere Cache would allow you to pick any zone throughout Europe or in the US uh, if you have a multi-region bucket in the US and, and run your workload there and have it have a zone local experience. 
So what I mean by that is like in the US, you have a multi-region bucket. Any zone in the US, you can place the cash in. The cash will be, uh, as you read it, will be ingested into that cash in the same zone as your VM. And then all subsequent reads will come from that lo zone local cash instead of doing uh, cross metro reads. Um, and so you'll have the local experience. All right. Um, and we have other things to help you with your data uh, intensive workloads. Uh, one of the common patterns we see is people with object storage create folders by uh, putting prefixes in front of the defined prefixes in front of the objects. These defined prefixes uh, then uh, are, are what the folder is. And what we do is in, with this uh, managed folders uh, product that we have just released is allow you to create IAM policies based on these prefixes. So essentially you have the ability to set IAM, policy, IAM policies on each folder. All right, um, couple, a few other things I'd like to show you, new products. We've got um, four other products I'd like to mention. We have a bunch more beyond this, but I think four products that would be worthwhile mentioning here for this crowd for data intensive workloads. The first one is a lot of people are running HDFS workloads on prem. We would like to help you get those into the cloud. So we have a transfer service to move those HDF workloads to the cloud for you in a simple, easy way. The next one is a cloud uh, storage fuse product for machine learning. This allows you to have a client, a, a local uh, file client, uh, giving you file system access to your GCS bucket. I'm fully supported by um, Google Cloud. The next one is uh, performance related. Um, those, uh, a lot of uh, people care a lot, a great deal about performance when you're running data intensive workloads. GRPC is a great uh, choice to, uh, to run, the, accelerate your workloads um, and it'll help save your wall clock time and uh, minimize the amount of idle CPU time that you may have and save you money. Uh, the last thing I wanna mention is the custom audit information. Custom audit information is a great way to help you keep track of what's going on and how your data is being used. It uh, passes the application and identity information for service accounts so that you can track them. And um, so these are the uh, products that I just want to make you all aware of. And let's uh, give Sandeep a, a chance to talk about and tell us about uh, Flipkart's journey. Thanks, Brad. So um, just a quick uh, brief about uh, Flipkart. Uh, uh, Flipkart is uh, India's leading e-commerce startup for the last uh, 16 years. Uh, and it is uh, one of the most successful startup stories in India. I'll uh, talk about Flipkart uh, scale to give an idea of uh, the complexity and the size of things. But uh, in general, uh, we have more than 450 million uh, registered users on platform which means uh, the entire population of United States and Canada, and then we still have 100 million more left uh, to account for. And uh, in terms of scale, which I'll come to a slide later, but to give an idea, it is uh, we ingest more than 100 billion events on a daily basis. So a uh, couple of years back, uh, we decided, and we also run our own private data center, so for most of our history from day one to 14 years, uh, we were running on our own data centers, and we have two of our own private data centers. And the data platform that I'm going to talk about today, we were running it on on-prem. Then why is it that we decided to move to uh, GCP, and that is what I'm going to share my insights with you. So when, we, uh, when I stepped back and looked at uh, what uh, people were doing, and I had some of the smartest people, I believe, on my team, we were doing a lot of work on managing the infra, because at this level of scale, there was a huge uh, effort to manage the infra. And we were also managing scale requirements, uh, which is like every, we have a yearly sale called the Big Billion Day Sales, uh, which our sales spikes 10x to 20x during that sales period. And that becomes a technical uh, challenge. So a lot of team members were busy on um, managing either the infra or uh, the scale issues. And as a like, data platform team, that doesn't seem uh, to be totally right. 
And my belief is that if we want to change something, whatever the team members are doing or thinking today, that is what the state of the art will be six months later in the company. So we decided to change and the things that uh, we wanted uh, the developers and the data platform thing in special to think was not infra, not scaling, but things about data platform, uh, data products, and also think about uh, optimization. So what kind of data products I wanted uh, team to think about? See, we do a real-time funnel analytics at uh, a scale of 100 billion of events ingested every day during peak sale, uh, sale period, giving real-time information to our uh, leadership. We wanted to prepare data for our ML and uh, data science algorithms. We want to spend more effort in doing data quality checks upfront so that it's not the customer who's reporting data issues and data quality issues, but we can run our own data unit test and data integrity test, et cetera. And then we want to remove almost a layer of analytics uh, in between the end user, the business user, and the platform by using Gen AI kind of tools. The other thing is optimization. So it is great that uh, GCP can provide you with uh, unlimited storage and unlimited compute, and I think it puts us uh, into a little bit of uh, confident situation. But I'll tell you it is not your and my responsibility to test that out. It is very important that the data uh, is considered and compute and data are optimized. Otherwise, soon they become a next, another level of problem that is unmanageable and we don't want to deal with that. In the GCP, uh, what we found, because they've done the compute storage separation, as Brad was uh, telling you, and they support both um, the open source as well as their own uh, uh, functional uh, services stack, I think we decided that we'll be able to use uh, all of that. So here, uh, just a uh, little detour, the number uh, that we process on a daily basis, uh, I think 130 billion messages, I was saying 100 million. During this transition, we had to also transfer 30 petabytes of data, which is hot data. We also have more than 45 petabytes of cold data. Overall, closer to 100 petabytes now. How big is 35 petabytes of data? I think if we ta transfer data in the best case, over a 10 Gbps link, 30 petabytes of data takes a year to transfer if there are no hiccups in the network. So having said that about the scale, I think uh, the data optimization problem for us was really important because we knew from experience that if we take our eyes away from the optimization, we will be soon dealing with problems of scale that we don't have to deal with. And Fortunately, the GCP stack gave us the flexibility to either use PopSub or uh, uh, for ingestion, to use Dataproc, BigQuery for uh, compute side, but we also could use our own stack for which we are familiar with, which we have optimized over the years, our own framework, which was built over the open source uh, stack. And I think that helped us in making sure that we are running the data pipelines and other processes in the most optimal fashion, due to which we could run much more number of processes, much more richer algorithms over time. To give an idea of uh, the stack that we are using, if you uh, look carefully, maybe this is a complicated uh, figure, but basically what it says is that we, uh, we use Kafka to ingest from our server side data to take care of the back pressure and ingest it into PubSub from the millions, hundreds of millions of uh, mobile devices, the data is ingested directly to PubSub. We do not have to worry about scale and other issues. And then we also run uh, Hadoop. We run uh, certain of our workloads on Hive, which are uh, already suited or been optimized for there. We extensively run on BigQuery also, uh, and are able to sometime recover from errors or when we have to redo the computation due to human or certain other errors related to data ingestion, we are able to do it quickly. But overall, what this stack uh, shows is that we are able to mix the best of uh, thing coming from native GCP platform offerings as well as open source offerings. And that's been one of the key reasons why we are also able to run in a very optimized fashion. Another uh, interesting fact is that we did uh, complete this migration in under uh, in around six months of time. And this is a live migration where the 
data pipelines are running 24 bar 7, our month end closure reports, accounting reports, which have to be closed and accounted for are getting closed every month after month. And uh, in six months time, I think with a lot of support from Google side, both on uh, tech stack and on the uh, other aspect of uh, migration, including optimization, uh, this was uh, pretty successful. And to close off this, I think uh, in post-migration, I've seen from my personal effect, the speed of innovation uh, has really increased many folds. Uh, people are now developing data products. They're churning it out at much faster rate. Uh, the data quality related assertions and able to catch data quality problems much earlier has uh, uh, been actually at a very good state. And, could be famous last word, I don't know what's happening now. Um, and it, it's been a successful story which has given us a breather to go and innovate where it matters for the company and not worry about uh, scaling the infrastructure or managing the infrastructure. Uh, with this, I'll hand over to Jason. I think you have just one more slide here. Oh. All right. All right. Give it up for Sandeep. First of all, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to Brad for inviting me to share the stage with them. Google Cloud is a strategic partner of Databricks, and uh, I feel honored to be able to present to you guys today. So first of all, who is Databricks? If you haven't heard of us, we are, we are the lake house company. So we are the ones who created and pioneered the concept of the data lake house. And what that is, it means you should be able to write your data, any type of data, and one, one time in the place that's most scalable and the cheapest place, which would be GCS, and then leverage that one copy of your data for all your different use cases, whether that be batch ETL, streaming, data warehousing, or artificial intelligence and machine learning applications. Um, we are the only, um, only, only vendor recognized by Gartner as a leader in both the database management systems quadrant as well as data science and machine learning uh, platform quadrant. So we're, we're unique in that regard. And one thing to note is uh, we were co-founded by the original creators of Apache Spark. So we've got open source, you know, coursing through our veins. And, and since our founding, we actually created a couple other open source projects. So one of them is MLflow, which allows you to have um, an open source platform for how to do the complete machine learning at life cycle. Um, and as well as Delta Lake, which is what I want to talk to you today. Delta Lake is um, the de facto standard for how to manage transactions on top of a data lake. So what is Delta Lake? Um, it's, a, it's an open format. What it is is essentially whenever you're writing data out to GCS, what you're gonna do is uh, with Delta Lake, you're gonna be writing a whole bunch of parquet files and alongside those parquet files is a transaction log. And that transaction log is what allows you to do um, inserts, updates, deletes, merge statements, and do it concurrently across multiple writers at the same time. It also gives you performance benefits because now that you have this uh, transaction log, you can treat that as a manifest. And so when you do go to do queries, you instead of doing a whole bunch of uh, different list calls to GCS, now you're just basically looking at the manifest and deciding what's the smallest number of files and blocks that I have to read to be able to satisfy a query. We built uh, Delta Lake from the ground up to be able to do both batch and streaming. So when I was um, listening to Sandeep talk, I, I just, uh, I got, um, I felt like, oh, we've got a lot of different similarities here because we deal with scale on a daily basis. So we're uh, ingesting two exabytes of data every day in Delta Lake, and some of our customers are ingesting up to five petabytes a day on Delta Lake. And because you have to deal with data volumes that large, you can't just rely on batch processing because you could get in a scenario where if, you're, if your batch process fails and your, your, iter, your, um, your window is not big enough, you might not ever be able to catch up. So you have to be able to process data in a streaming way. And so we designed uh, Delta Lake from the beginning to do both batch and streaming. Um, we, uh, the transaction log I talked about offer some other benefits too. So we have something called change data flow that's built in, and that means instead of querying the table directly in a static form, you can query the actual transactions in the transaction log and get a, a stream of those transactions. Likewise, if you want to query a table as it existed at a point in time in the past, you can take advantage of time travel as well, all thanks to the transaction log. 
And so there's been a lot of different benchmarking um, on different lake house formats, and all of them come out with Delta Lake as being the fastest. And if you want to look at a really good one, there's one that Berkeley did, uh, I think last year, called the Lake House Benchmark, LHB, and it kind of like goes through a number of different scenarios for both you know, querying as well as inserts and merge statements. It gives you a holistic picture of, of um, how all these different formats operate and what how they perform and what the read amplification is and write amplification is. So I'm really excited today to talk about um, Databricks and how we integrate so well with Google. We've um, we had a really good partnership, and when we first deployed Databricks, we actually leveraged GKE to deploy the clusters. So the way that Databricks works is your data um, stays within your cloud account, your Google account, within your buckets, and then whenever you spin up clusters uh, to process that data, those clusters stay within your Google account as well. And so Databricks is basically has a control plane that's orchestrating all this on your behalf, but you're in complete control. And we've been, you know, I mentioned that Databricks, you know, is a big believer in open source technology, and I know it aligns really well with Google's values as well. Um, and the nice thing is once you write all of your data once into uh, Delta Lake on GCS, then you can bring whatever engine you want to it. So you can bring a uh, big query if you want to query that data, or a data proc if you want to do some ETL processing. Databricks, we have our own engine. We built a, a native vectorized engine called Photon, and it implements the Spark API. So anything that you can run on Apache Spark, you can also run on our Photon engine. And, in, and generally, it runs about seven to eight times faster. So you can take advantage of, of those performance benefits on Databricks as well. And the nice thing is that we're available in the, the Google Cloud Marketplace. So you've already got Databricks. All you got to do is just go to the Marketplace, search for it, find it. You get a 14-day free trial. Uh, try it out, see what you like. And because it's in the marketplace, it actually burns down your enterprise agreement as well. So um, there's no reason not to try it. And one last thing before we get to uh, Q&A here is we announced something called Uniform earlier this year at our own summit. And what Uniform is, is it's part of the open source Delta Lake project. And there's a couple different um, lake house formats out there. So there's Delta Lake, which is part of the Linux Foundation. And then there's Apache Iceberg and Apache Hoodie. Uh, now, some customers we found are using two, if not all three of these, and what they really want is they want compatibility and portability. So what we've done is um, we've created something called Uniform where when you write the data out to Delta Lake, it'll automatically replicate the metadata, that transaction log, into the other formats, so for Hoodie and Iceberg. This allows you to get all the performance benefits of writing out to Delta Lake, and then if you need the portability of being able to read that same data in different engines, then you can read it as an iceberg table or as a hoodie table. Um, this is you know, really useful because some engines, they end up implementing one of these formats before the other ones, and so and then the customers are caught just waiting for all these engines to catch up. Now you don't have to wait anymore. You can just use Uniform and write your data once and leverage it across any engine. So with that, I think I'm gonna invite up uh, um, Vivek and the others. <laughs> 